Hey there, my name's Rod Yates, and you're listening to Humans of Music, a Jackson podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned along the way. And my guest today is rapper, author, actor, and activist, Briggs. Adam Briggs is the ultimate multitasker. As a solo artist or with AB Original, he's become one of Australia's most respected rappers. But he's also appeared in shows such as Clever Man and The Weekly, written for TV series such as Disenchantment and Black Comedy, and this year he even released his first children's book, Our Home, Our Heartbeat. As a student growing up in the regional Victorian town of Shepparton, though, he was told he'd never amount to anything. So how has this man who was told he had no prospects, who's had to fight and claw for every opportunity, got to where he is today? Well, that is what we are here to find out. More than a performer and an artist, Briggs has also become a role model for young Indigenous Australians, and he talks about coming to terms with that in this interview. He also discusses the backlash and abuse he's been subjected to throughout his career and the lessons he's learned as he's dealt with it. But we start with his new solo EP, Always Was, which Briggs says is a more personal release than his politically charged work with AB Original. And we pick up the conversation talking about how it feels to have new music out. Yeah, it's like, you know, back to basics, really, for me. Like, this is what I started doing. So, it's like, you know, I, I know I'm, like, tied up doing a whole lot of other things, but um, to get back to music and just, like, you know, it was a whole lot of fun to be back just making stuff and, like, just creating and living in the studio and, and um, you know, carving up songs and ideas and, you know, like... I think as a as a um, as a creator, like that's my main thing, like just outlet. Um, you know, I just like making stuff. So, you know, if I'm not making a TV show or you know books or writing or something like that, like music is like obviously where I really want to be. So it's great to be back, having a new <laughs> a new piece of work. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of the songs on there, Socks Hat, which has that line, uh, I can't change my ways, I just stay the same. Yeah. Um, and it seems quite a damning indictment of someone or something. Who, who, what inspired that song? Um, just like, like, again, like, I just like to write songs that are about ideas, you know what I mean? Like the idea of being stuck in a perpetual party, you know what I mean? And the idea of like you know substance abuse and and stuff so it's not really like um like it, it's not my own personal thing because because i can quit whenever i want you know what i mean like mm. <laughs> it was it, it was just an idea of like you know let's talk let's talk about that like you know someone like the whole the whole idea of the point of that track is like someone at a party who's like kind of battling with their own demons you know what i mean like yeah yeah like as people do when they're on drugs and drunk and high and whatever it's like you know what am i doing with my life and mm. <laughs> um have you been in that position um no no nah, not really like like I, I i think you know everyone's been you know had that hangover or i'm never drinking again and stuff but like I've been close to that position but I've always had a pretty good willpower and a pretty good discipline to like you know be like nah I'm not doing that today you know what I mean so right. so like I can't really like I've I've been close enough to look at it and know it you know what I mean but thankfully I haven't had to you know you know I, I quit booze for a while a while back, I quit for like you know five or six years. Mm. So like, you know, kind of to prove to myself that I could, and I had too much work to do. I couldn't be drunk, you know what I mean. So yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I don't, I don't think I've had anything that I knew I couldn't quit. You know what I mean? Right. If there was anything that was like that, it would have been work for me. You know what I mean? And you talked before about um, it's nice to be back in music. And obviously since Shep Life, you've really established yourself with as an author, an actor, a writer, an activist. Is Does music still feel like your comfort zone? Uh, yeah, because like that's where I started. It's like the back of the hand, you know what I mean? Like I know how to do that. 
any day of the week. Um, so yeah, music's definitely still, still like the main, the first love. You know what I mean? So yeah, the one I always travel back to. But that that willingness to go outside of that comfort zone is that something you've always had? Yeah, I don't feel like you make stuff that's like great when you're comfortable. I think you have to push yourself a little bit more to make something like you know memorable. Mm. Um, so yeah, like I've I've always endeavoured to push myself a little bit more to to you know test the boundaries and I try to do that on every single one of my releases. You know, mm. I mean, you, you've spoken about growing up in Shepparton and, and how um, opportunities there aren't many opportunities. Was it because of that? Is that what instilled that willingness to to push yourself? Is that where that came from? Yeah, because you had to figure out how to do it yourself, yeah. So, like, you know, Shepard and didn't have studios and didn't have, you know, much of a support around that. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, you don't um, – so, like, you figure out how to do it yourself, you know mm. what I mean? You have to figure out how to create these – opportunities and you know because opportunity doesn't always knock sometimes you have to knock for it um i was always on the front foot about creating my own um opportunities and trying to take an opportunity and work it even further you know what i mean like always trying to push things to the next level and um i think that's like testament to my whole career Mm. Did someone instill that in you or, or were you just born with it? Um, I think it's just something that's like from my whole community. Like, you know, we've always gone above and beyond. Um, and so, like, it was – I didn't find it too hard. Like, I felt like it was almost in my DNA mm-hmm. to push and go a bit, a bit harder and a bit further, you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah, and in terms of Shepherd, and how do you think growing up in Shepherd and shaped you as a person? Um, well, it's just like, what else do you know? You know what I mean? Like, there's it wasn't like I had a, um, anything else to draw a barometer to, or you know, mm-hmm. so it was just. I guess it just you know kind of nothing was taken for granted. You know what I mean? In what Nothing way? was taken for well, like opportunities weren't like because I had to wake up and catch a six o'clock in the morning train, you know what I mean, to get to Melbourne to be able to get around the city and do what I have to do and you know, so like when I went down to Melbourne, when I went to the city, like, you know, every opportunity that you had, you really you really work for, you really spent your time in the studio, you know, spending all your money that you make on studio time and stuff like that, like um, you try to use every single hour, you know what I mean? Like mm. you, you live in the studio if you're paying for it, you're eating in there, you're living out of the, you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was your first experience of doing that? Uh, just like when I was first in Shepparton, and um, – like leaving Shepparton to go to like Melbourne to Stronghorn Studios and hanging out there and it's like really like I'd sleep there the whole weekend and then I'd then I'd catch the train back to Shepparton um, on the Sunday. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. So that was like really like sleeping on the studio floor because like you don't want to stop working and you also can't afford a hotel so. Did it feel magical though? Being being in Melbourne, being in the studio. Nah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think magical is the word. Um, I don't know, but it, it, I don't know. Like it didn't feel magical, but it definitely felt like where I wanted to be. Okay. And you you've spoken of. Um, coming from quite a big family. I know you had two brothers and two sisters and, and a lot of cousins. Was it, was it a tight family unit? Yeah. 
yeah, everyone's tight. Like, you know, like the cousins are also like brothers and sisters too, you know. So, mm. and I was the youngest, um, which, you know, kind of carved my personality as well. Well, you, you've talked about that's kind of maybe where you got your quick wit because you always had to have a comeback. Is- yeah, because I was getting ripped on, you know what I mean? And like, I was also like, you know, the thing is, if you're the youngest, you're on the bottom of the totem pole too. So you always had to like, I was always had to stick up for myself, you know? So. Yeah. Is that the first time that you realized that humor could be a weapon? Um, I don't think so. I was like, humor was kind of my, like, I didn't really, I didn't really have any kind of diagnosis for anything like of this until I was much older. Like I was just very impulsive and, and living in the moment, you know, like, yeah, like at school I was, you know, horrible student. So yeah, like. In what way? Oh, I was just always interrupting and distracting the class and being a jerk. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I was a horrible kid, but. You know, it is what it is, and yeah, like I don't, yeah, I didn't any, really have any epiphanies about anything I was doing until I was much older. When do you remember when 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 those epiphanies started? Not really. Like it's just like when you're trying to put your words together and explain yourself and what kind of kid you were, and you know what talk to you know what you experiences in music and stuff like that like wasn't so much um there was never a moment of like ah uh aha you know what i mean yep not for me no okay i mean you you just called yourself a terrible kid in in what way were you a terrible kid i was super annoying you know like i was a terrible student i was just interrupting you know, class clown activities as usual. Right. Just just regular just regular scallywag behaviour. But what what about outside of school? Um I guess it's a pretty standard country kid upbringing. You know, BMX bikes and dirt jumps and video game and arcade parlors and you know, fist fights and whatnot. <laughs> Pretty, pretty standard country kid activities. Do you have fond memories of them? Um, yeah, sure. Like, like it's, it's not like I look back and, you know, it's like, I, like I'm pretty fortunate, you know. Like I don't look back at anything with any kind of um, disdain except for school. Mm. Um, yeah, so... It's it's all like you know. All all I ever can do is like be like, well, I'm here now, you know. Yeah, that's what made me the kid I was then. Makes me the man I am today, right? Sure. So I'm happy with that. I, I think I did okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you've spoken about. I think you were in grade six when a teacher at school told you that you'd never amount to anything. Yeah, more than once. <laughs> 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 That that goes through the you know that that goes through the roll the roll call and then and then Adam Briggs yep won't amount to anything yes cool <laughs> but that must have what effect did that have it was it water off a duck's back or or it must have some sort of impact on you um not until later until I realised that there's probably not something you should be saying to a kid you know mm. when you're at school and you're the you know class clown bad kid anyway. It's you versus the teachers anyway. Mm-hmm. So they're going to say all these hateful things and blah, 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 you know, in your narrative of school life, right? So mm-hmm. whatever. But when you were growing up and it's like, man, you shouldn't say that to a kid because what if that kid didn't have some kind of like disgusting, self-assured personality <laughs> like me? <laughs> and, he, and, he was, and this kid was a bit more, you know, susceptible to insults and Put down like it's a dangerous thing to to say to somebody. You shouldn't do that. Mm. Was there anyone telling you otherwise, or did you just have that self confidence? Bit of both, yeah. Like everyone was always kind of, 
you know, good job. And, you know, like I did have teachers throughout school that were, you know, nice, but like they didn't, they just didn't know how to like, cause they weren't educated either. They didn't know how to interact with a kid like me. You know what I mean? Like mm. this, this school system was not developed to nurture, you know, indigenous kids or even kids that like, you know, thought a different way. It's like if you don't want to, f- if you don't fit into the mold, you know, it's going to be a very tough time for you. You know what I mean? That's the idea. Now write this down off the board. You know what I mean? Like everybody mm-hmm. thought I had this issue with learning. It wasn't an issue with learning I had. It was an issue with the structure because I like learning. It was, it was an issue with the curriculum and an issue with the structure. Like they didn't teach to, you know, they, they teach you how to be a worker. They teach you how to how to sit still, you know what I mean? And I wasn't that kid. Look at me. Mm. That wasn't me. What What did you need, do you reckon? Understanding, a bit of flexibility, teach to what I like, you know? I know it's a that's a hard thing to ascertain when it's like 30-odd kids in the classroom. And, like, I don't blame the teachers because they just exist in that, you know, in that structure as well. And... You know, it's not it's not for them either, because they got to deal with the likes of me. It's mm-hmm. a really bad, you know, that kind of situation is really bad. Mm. And so, your mum was a midwife, is that right? Uh kind of. She ran the Indigenous Birth um, Program. Okay. And what did that entail? What did what did you see her doing? Um, well, I just knew that she was going to. Um, she was going to the hospital a lot, you know what I mean? Like, because, like, she would, you know, she overseen all these babies being born, over 500 babies, you know, in her years there, um, the Indigenous Birthing Program in Shepparton. Both my parents worked. Yeah. Both my parents were flat out. So, like, I got a lot of time, you know, Shout out to PlayStation and Nintendo for holding it down. <laughs> you know, sh- shout out to Sharon Footballs and and um, and Spalding. You know what I mean? Basketballs for, <laughs> for keeping me occupied and holding it down. <laughs> well, you've spoken about you know your love of The Simpsons and your love of wrestling, um, mm. and particularly you know your love of heavy metal and punk and hip hop. Were yeah. they? <sighs> Not surrogate parents, but were they the things that you used your you spent your time doing when when you were by yourself? I think so, yeah. Because like I just loved entertainment, you know, you know what I mean. And those forms of entertainment, punk, metal, rap, hip hop, um, action movies, horror movies, professional wrestling, like they're all the most extreme versions of their of their genre. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like if 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 sport was an ice cream, you know, wrestling would be the the you know the top the syrup and the, <laughs> the the syrup and the sprinkles on top. You know, it's all concentrated. It's all syrup. All this stuff that I love the most was all the you know purest, most concentrated form of entertainment. You know, yeah. So it's like if I'm watching a movie, it had to be Predator. If I'm watching, you know, if I'm listening to a metal band, it's like I, I want to hear Guns N' Roses. If I'm listening to rap music, I want Ice Cube. You know what I mean? I want the most intense version of that, um, of the entertainment. And then as you get older, you get to appreciate all the other stuff in between. Yeah, yeah. What did did it give you an outlet? Did we, you know, you, you were talking about at school, you weren't, it just wasn't the right environment for you. Did Did that sort of stuff give you an outlet? Yeah, because, like, some teachers were pretty cool with me um, having a Walkman and, like, I could listen to my tapes mm. as I did my work. In class? Yeah. Yeah, right. And, like, that was okay. You know, like, it, it helped me, like, concentrate. It gave me a little bit of freedom. I wasn't bothering anybody else and I got to listen to my, you know, my music. and Like, not all the time, obviously. Mm. But part of the time, and it gave me something to look forward to, you know. Yeah. So 
And I just loved it. I just loved entertainment, comedy. You know what I mean? If it's comedy, it had to be Eddie Murphy. <laughs> it's like everything was just so heightened. Like everything had to be so extreme. Yeah. And was that typical of your your fa- your brothers and sisters as well? Nah. Nah, everyone else was pretty like pretty low key. Like everybody else likes some stuff. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Like, like you know, one of my sisters, and my brother would like Marilyn Manson or mm-hmm. something like that. Whereas, like, you know, I needed Slayer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like Manson was cool, but I want that real heavy stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and like being a being an indigenous, like being a black kid in the Slayer was a bit odd, right? There was probably were any of your mates into it? Nah, I didn't find Slayer until I was in high school, and then some of my my white friends obviously were into Slayer. Yeah, you know what I mean in the in the age of Limp Biscuit and which was the soundtrack for then. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Pretty some, you know what with Limp Biscuit they like found some fantastic guitar work. Oh yeah, like really intuitive like. Uh, you know guitar work but yeah like um yeah i was just like yeah always the extreme i think yeah. after the break briggs talks about the moment he realized he loved hip-hop his first public performances and why you never ever want to take his mic off him when he's on stage welcome back to humans of music and my interview with adam briggs In the past, Briggs has said that some of his earliest memories of growing up in Shepparton involved going to funerals, and we pick up the conversation talking about those experiences. Yeah, it's like you'd go to a few funerals a year. Always someone in the community would pass away and you'd go to a funeral. And I think that's what kind of talked to my, you know, need to be like, well, you could be dead at any point, so you better do what you want. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that's what made me talk to that. Like, because I was like, I don't know why I'm the way I am, but maybe that could be a little bit of part of it. It was like watching people die and being like, you know, they were in their 40s. And then, like, I'm, what am I, 34 this year? You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I guess, like, I could definitely, like, not that I was ever like, I'm going to die soon. But I was like, you know, life's too short to not do what you want. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, how early, how, how young were you, and you think you learned that lesson? I don't know, because like I got really into doing what I want very early, <laughs> very early. <laughs> I was very, I was, you know, I was very. That really clicked with me instantly, doing what I want, <laughs> whatever I want. Uh, yeah, so like you know, as I said, like th- there was never really a moment for me. Except when I seen Ice Cube on Rage. That's the only moment where I was like, ping. That was it? That was a light bulb moment? That was the, that's the only light bulb moment I can really think of off the, off the top of my head. That's when I knew that it was like, no, nah, rap music is the music for me. How old were you? Can you remember? Must have been like 10, something like that. Okay. A little bit younger. And so it was instantaneous? You, you started trying to figure out how to do it from that point on? No, not really. I was just like, that's what I, that's the music I like. Because okay. like, you know, I'd heard other like I'd like bands before. Um, you know, I'd like Guns and Roses, and I'd like Public Enemy. You know what I mean? But I just like the kind of I, I think I just like the energy around it too. You know, it was very. There was no reason to not like it. You know, yeah. but I don't know. It felt like when I seen Ice Cube on. Um, on when I seen Ice Cube on um on Rage, that was when I f- no one showed me that you know what I mean. I found this by myself. That was no yours. One, yeah, this was no. This was my thing. You know, no one gave me the Ice Cube tape. Uh-huh. I found that by myself, and I was like really proud of that. And I was like, was, you know, the Predator album and all that. Yeah. Just, it was killer. And like, yeah, like, so that was like the moment for me when I was like, this is the music that I like. And how long after that, roughly, did you actually start thinking, this is something I can do? 
I see. I didn't think it was something I could do till I was like twenty. Really? Like, cause I, yeah, because I was rapping and stuff, like when I was fifteen or whatever. But I never thought, hey, I'm going to be a rapper, because like, I guess like because you were told you're not going to be anything, mm-hmm. and then it's like being a rapper was so far away. It's like I'd be lucky if I was a forklift driver. I mean, I'm going to be a forklift driver. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so where were you rapping at 15? Oh, well, just at like, because you know all my mates had bands and stuff like that, and we were, and you know we were in bands and stuff. But I, I liked, as I said, like I liked music and I liked being in a band, but it's not what I really wanted. It was like you know how I like how I liked all these other all these other genres of music. I, I like them and I enjoy them and they're great and they're fantastic, but it didn't click with me as much as it clicked when I started rapping, mm-hmm. where I was like, no, nah, but this is what I really want to do. And then I was like, you know, I guess like I kind of spoke to myself at that point. It was like, you know, if this is what you really want to do, maybe you should just do it. And then you're like, you know, because you're in this moment of like, you do what you want all the time. Why is this different? Because someone told you you couldn't. You know, so I was like, oh, hang on. What if I just start doing it? And then, like, you you look around and you see, like, you start doing a bit of research and, you know, checking it out. And it's like, oh, the Hilltop Hoods are doing it. They're from, they're from Adelaide. Mm-hmm. And they were the first kind of um, hip-hop group in Australia that I heard that were, like, making good songs. Mm-hmm. They kind of stood up next to the other underground kind of stuff I was listening to at the time. I was like, oh, no, these guys, they're good at it. Like, they, it, like it, it's not even good for Australia. This is good. Mm. You know, so, like, yeah, it kind of snowballed from that. And So to eventually be embraced by them. Yeah. And by Crazy, Golden right? Yeah. What was that? Was that, um, like, that vindicate your decision or, or did it affirm for you that you were you're actually good at it? Yeah, it was like, it was like, by that point in my career, I was doing it no matter what. Mm. So like, I'd I'd got really decent on the mic by then, and I was like, you know, I'm doing it now. Like, whether you, it doesn't matter who signs me, I'm getting on. I'm mm. going. You know what I mean? Like I was, but then the hoods were like, we love that energy. And that's one of the things I tell people. It's like, yeah, if you want to do it, just start doing it. Mm-hmm. And then the people that you want will be drawn to your energy and they'll help you. And that's what happened. Like, I was doing it. I was like, bang, and, I, and like, testing it because, like, I was the only artist not from Adelaide. And what did it represent to you? Did it did it represent a way out? Is that what you saw in, in hip-hop? Um, I saw a way in. <laughs> Into what? Into my life into my career you know into my art so like I was always doing it like everybody always talks about the way out but like when you're indigenous in Australia you live on the out Mm. you know what I mean it's like I wanted to get in and make this room mine I'm going to find my space in here and then I'm going to let everyone else in (laughs) (laughs) well and then you end up curating a night at the opera house exactly (laughs) many many years on oh man it's crazy, right? Like, even for some people, curating one night at the opera house would be like, you know, one thing for their career. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I'm pretty fortunate, man. I get to do all these all these rad things. So it's good fun. Yeah. So, w- when was your first public um, performance as an MC? Um, maybe like in Shepparton, like at a at like a Battle of the Bands thing. With me and my mate Pete, who's a rapper too, and like we're both, we're both like just rapping like our songs over Dr. Dre instrumentals, like horribly horrible <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but like, I, you know, you got to start somewhere. Absolutely. Was it accepted yeah. in in Shepparton? Nah, not really. <laughs> but um, it's all right. Like. If I, was, if I was worried about being accepted in Shepparton, and like, you know, you're probably you're probably in for the wrong career. Yeah. Um, 
but that's where it kind of started, you know. It, like like anything, man, it starts, you know, not unless you're on one of those, you know, poxy sing for the judges shows do you start in front of a live audience that's, you know, or on TV. Of course. <laughs> so, of course. yeah. Them, open mics in Melbourne, you know, like because, like, that's where I really – like that's where it really started to count. Okay. When I was outside of my comfort zone in Melbourne on open mics, you know what I mean, and jumping up a hip hop night, grabbing a mic, you know. Yeah, like you got to have guts to do that. Yeah. Well, it's like it was a bit of the thing of like that, like because I knew I was nice, so it's like the anonymity also helped because no one knew who I was. I was just this rapper from Shepparton. And I'd mm-hmm. grab up, grab the mic, rap about punching everyone in the face. And then, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just all that good party stuff. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so when you get to the point where you make homemade bombs in 2009, yep. and when you first released that, you did that very DIY. You pretty much did everything yourself. Yeah. Which is I indicative did. of what you were saying earlier. You just kind of got to this point where you thought, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. But I did what, everything myself. <laughs> yeah. And so what What did that entail? Like ex- you know how what? did that work? There's one lesson from that that I remember to this day and I carry with me all the time. I was um, sending letters, EP, you know, my own presser to all these um, – to all the street press in Australia back when that was a thing. <laughs> um, and it was like back then it was like, you know, each city had 10, you know what I mean? Yeah, I remember. So I was sending like emails to the editors and music editors, any email I could find, just searching, just trawling the internet and sending my EP and presser and asking them to review it or you know what I mean like just and then like halfway through it I kind of got I got lazy and um and I just got just started cut and pasting fucking the email and then um I got an email back from this dude in Brisbane I can't remember who it was but he like he roasted me you know, you send me back this scathing email. Like, how dare you send me a cut and paste email when I'm the fucking editor of Street Press magazine, whatever. Mm. And like, you know, it's like if you want to get anywhere in this industry, like you're going to have to fucking blah, blah, blah or pay someone to do it for you or this, that and the third. And, you know, like really went in like, you know, this is lazy. This is not how you get noticed. This is not how you, direct, you know, address people. They really took really took the time to fucking tear some shreds. <laughs> <laughs> but bro, it worked. Like I took notice, man, and I sent him an email back. And like, cause like normally I could be like, you know, being a smart ass kid, like you might be like, "Hey, fuck you," you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I'm doing this myself. Cut me a break. But I was like, you know what? He's right. It was a big lesson. Yeah, he was right, and I was like, "Fuck, thanks." And then. From that point on, I was like, if you want to get respected, don't half ass it. Like give it give it the energy that you would give, you know, anything else. If you want it to be respected, give it that respectful energy. Mm. And yeah, so that's like the number one thing that I learned from that EP and I carry that with me today. How would you compare the Briggs that made that EP with who you are today? Well, Drunker, angrier. <laughs> um, it's hard to say. You're just on the right path. Like, you know what I mean? But what was fueling that anger? I think just being, you know, being not heard. Um, but yeah, like, um, I think the anger was just like, you know, any indigenous, you see our anger every March, you know what I mean? Every NAIDOC week, every protest, you know, every Jan 26. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So yeah, like it's not like our, um, you know, it's it's always there. So like you know, I was just channeling that. I guess you know, not being hurt for so long. I think that really spoke to it. You know. Mm. So I mean, in terms of your indigenous culture and your heritage, I mean, growing up, how how do you learn about your tribe and about your culture? Um, that's just like stories from your grandparents and your parents and aunties and uncles and them passing on stories and because it's not a written history, right? So it's all it's all that, like you know, art and and that. It's like that's how it's passed on, and you know, even our our cultural values and and you know the stuff that we carry around with us you know how we how we navigate and operate in the world um like that's it's, again it's one of those hard things to kind of read because you're like um you don't know any other way mm. you know was it from a young age that that those stories were taught yeah from day 1 day 1 um, yeah, like, there's not much, there's not much else to, like, as I said, like, I, I don't have another, another way to, to, um, to measure it up against, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it, it was just, it was like, you know, that's the kind of testament to always was, always will be. It's like. You don't know anything before it, you know what I mean? So this is just this is the um this is the truth, you know, this is the reality. Mm-hmm. When when did you become aware that the play the playing field between the indigenous population and, and white Australia wasn't equal? Again, from the start. From the very start. Like you don't really like it was like, oh, hang on, things are a little bit different here. You know what I mean? Like, we do get treated a little, little bit differently and, you know, the racism was very prevalent, you know, in, in Shepparton. Like what were um, you saying or what were you subjected to? Oh, just the regular ex- exclusion and name-calling and, you know, and uh, like even the fact that, you know, my earliest memories of funerals, like... <laughs> mm. Not many people would um, would have that, you know what I mean? Like, as the, um, I guess the, the cornerstone of their memories. <laughs> yeah, but how how do you make sense of that, particularly when you're young? I think you can't. You don't. And I think that's part of the kind of life that Indigenous people live in Australia. It is like we live in this you know, two different worlds and having to deal with that kind of absurdity and, you know, on top of everything else. Um, so, yeah, it's like if you try to make sense of it, you'll go nuts. It's a, it's like because it's just, it's just unfair. You know, there's, there's not much, there's not much sense to make out of that. You know, if you know what I mean? Mm. Not to... Not to like diminish the question, but the idea that we could make sense of the dispossession is like is really difficult. You know what I mean? Like it's a really difficult concept for people to to understand. You're absolutely right. It's not the kind of thing you can make sense of. But I suppose it's something that you had to internalize or to figure out how to deal with. Was was music and art how you figured out how to to channel what you were thinking? Um, just writing and writing in general, really. Like, like, I, like, I think anyone finds their, whatever their vocation might be is like where they give all their energy, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a footballer, you kick a football, you know what I mean? Like, that's where you might be free for those minutes, you know? <laughs> Nothing else matters in those minutes. And I think, I feel like that's what it was like for me, like with music, nothing else in that moment mattered, you know what I mean? Like except making that song or doing that show, you know what I mean? Like for fleeting moments anyway, like everything, like, you know, we were on even playing fields. 
Mm. And the other thing was, it was like I was pretty nice on the microphone and I could rip someone pretty decently. So like, you know, in the blood sport that is hip hop, you know, I was, I was a good contender, you know, so there was more freedom there too. Why is it a blood sport? Well, I was like, not many other, not many other genres of music have face to face battle to battle. You know what I mean? Like, Mm. so, you know, which can be pretty violent at times, lyrically as well as physically. You know what I mean? So, you don't really hear about that at, you know, folk rock. (laughs) (laughs) But you would be at at, um, battles and they would become physical? 100%, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially if they're just in the street and not organised, you know? Yeah. And was that when you were living in Melbourne or or when you were in Shepparton? Yeah. There wasn't so much of a battle scene in Shepparton. There was a little thing, but not heaps. But, yeah, in Melbourne for sure. Okay. People and would get rocked. Right. Was there, Is there one that sticks out that you're involved in? No, not really. Like, it was just all the old hip-hop kind of shit. You know what I mean? Like, if someone was whack or if you thought someone sucked, you'd jump on stage and you'd take the microphone off them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, just, just scallywag behavior. Did that happen to you? No, you're not taking my microphone, man. You're pussing <laughs> your fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I, I still got a bit of that. I still got a bit of that in me. So if you jump on my stage, man, like, that, that can be a dangerous place if you're not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Don't do it to yourself because, like, I'm not about to be a sucker either. So, yeah, you know, don't. Please don't. After the break, Briggs talks about being a role model for Indigenous Australians, becoming a target for right-wing commentators, and what it was like working on a TV show with one of his heroes, The Simpsons creator, Matt Groening. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Adam Briggs. Briggs's music, acting and writing have become vehicles not only to entertain, but also to educate people about the issues facing Indigenous Australians. And we pick up the conversation talking about the moment he realised he could use his art in this way. I was kind of already doing it on Homemade Bombs and The Blacklist, but it was really when I did like Children Came Back Mm -hmm. that it really like, like, hang on a minute, you know what I mean? I could really, here's a platform you know, going out to millions, um, what do you want to say? It's like, well, you got three and a half minutes, you know what I mean, to teach people something if you want. Mm. And um, that's what I did. Um, so it was, yeah, it was like, it was really then that I figured out like, hey, you've got a great platform to utilize. It might be worth doing something for everybody that can really, you know, live on and how did you see that manifest like how did you see the the positive result of that just like because like this was the social media boom at the at that point right so everyone mm-hmm. was on was on all these different um you know everyone was on facebook and whatnot and you just see like it resonating with people and people sharing it beyond um beyond your circle or beyond what you thought was, you know, who you thought were were important or beyond even who you thought knew who you were. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. that's when you're like, okay, I struck a, I struck a note here. Which must be exciting. Yeah. It was like, I'm I'm just thankful that I did the right thing. You know, I I didn't jump up there and just do like a parody song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, which is like, Always on the cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've spoken about how um, successful Indigenous people, um, there's almost an expectation that they'll become role, role models. Did you feel yeah. that? Yeah, it just happens, like whether you like it or not. You know, it's part of that always was thing. So, like, bro, you know, you can, you can turn it down as much as you want, as I tried, but it's just, it's just what comes with it, man. It's just part of it. Um, 
and like you just have to embrace it and use it to your own you know to make it your own story as well Mm -hmm. so it's not just you're the role model it's like yeah well like here's how I'm going to be a role model then you know what I mean not like everything I do is for everybody it's like no there's moments on this that are for certain audiences or just even just for myself even on the EP you know what I mean but there's moments on there that are definitely for everybody Mm. and like you can pick and choose what you want from it (laughs) is the act of just being successful and and moving into other disciplines on into writing and acting and and TV work is that in itself um setting yourself up as a role model i mean some there there will be indigenous yeah. kids who see that and aspire to that yeah man i wish but like you know it you don't like it doesn't really work that way it's like you wish that was enough but there's always a little bit extra, you know what I mean? I guess because, you know, and I think that falls back into the, you know, the communities, you know, is so far behind the eight ball on, you know, health and employment that you have to do extra because that's what's needed, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, like, you can't fight it. That's what I learned. You can't fight it. It's just... You just got to try to make the best decisions and let people take what they want. You know what I mean, and try to remove the expectation. You know a little bit and ask yourself what what your involvement is. You know what I mean. Yeah. And do you think you've arrived at the place where you're you've sorted that out in your in your own head? Nah, 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 nah. And I don't think it's I don't think it's somewhere where you arrive. I think it's some, something that evolves through the way you've been educating people and and through your art, you've obviously become a target for right-wing commentators and on social media. When did that first start to happen or when were you really conscious that it was happening? Straight away. Like straight away when Homemade Bombs came out or? Um, Yeah, like like obviously like, you know, I wasn't getting that much press around Homemade Bombs so I'm not that important to a right-wing you know, as I am to, you know, some some racist on, it was MySpace then. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, I feel like that kind of, um, that narrative and that backlash and that disdain for Indigenous people um, was already in the media from the start. So I was just walking into the house that, that was built on, you know what I mean? So I, it, it didn't like, oh, my God, I'm so surprised. Redneck announcer number one doesn't like me. And, you know, like right-wing announcer number four, you know, thinks I should be doing this to help my community. Like like they would know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That's the biggest, that's the biggest um, insult. You know what I mean? Like when they, when like, when all these people jump on social media and they're like, you should do this for your community and you should do that. It's like, man, what do you do for my community? Why do I have to do it? What do you do for my community? Fuck all. So you start doing something for my community, you don't get to say anything. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you, you got no, you've got no cultural bearing on, on any of my actions and whatever I want to do. So like, yeah. It doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, like, I said this once. Um, it's like, you know, because I was deleting, well, at a point, like, I, I used to put and leave racist comments on blast. And um, and so, like, I stopped doing it around um, after children came back. Mm-hmm. Because like a lot more kids were visiting my page, and I was like, "Well, I don't want to expose them to, you know, racists. Um, that is uh, unnecessary. Like they're going to get exposed to racism. I can't, I can't hide it from them, and I can't. But I cannot, like, you know, make it a, a performative piece. You know what I mean? So, because I said like, me cleaning up. You know, it's like these racist comments online don't bother me, like honestly. 
Or if they do bother me, it's like 1%. You know what I mean? But it all adds up, right? So it's like an uh, analogy I use, and I use analogies a lot to explain things to myself. It's like imagine you have a glass, right, and you, 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 yeah, you accidentally smash this glass in your house, and it's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not a big deal until the kid walks in there with no shoes on, and then you've got to hold up, quick, clean it up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if it's just me in the house, I can take my time and clean this thing up, you know what I mean? But if somebody else walks in, i got to tell them, hey, there's broken glass here. You might want to put some shoes on. <laughs> but you, you must have had to develop a skin, like a thick skin at some point. I mean, when, when you, you said that you walked into this house, but it's a, there's a difference between the house existing and then you actually becoming the target. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think I knew that I was like I didn't enter into into this like, oh geez, I hope me by you know doing January twenty six. Oh man, you know it's not like a big surprise to me that I pissed off a bunch of you know racists. Mm. So like I'm I, like I'm like especially these days, you know there's I'm a lot more calculative about you know my moves and you know I've I've done. I've done the troubleshoot and the homework before I do something. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, here's X, Y, Z um, things that could happen if I do this or post this or write this or perform this. You know what I mean? So it's like, and I think because, you know, I've done the homework, it's like, like it's really rare. I, I, like I still haven't been. And I'd never say never because it's an infinite universe with infinite possibilities. Yeah. But I haven't been surprised by a response yet. Right. When you think back to um, the song Let It Be Known of Shep Life, how I guess it addressed the fact that you had given up music for, for a little while prior to that. Was, was that, am I right in thinking that that is a time when um, some of the reactions to your music did actually get to you to the point where you wondered why you were doing it? Yeah, it, it wasn't so much like, the reactions to my music, it was like, it was the fact that I had racist fans. And I was like, you know, like, what's, what, who am I making music for if I've got racist fans? You know what I mean? Mm. And like, what's the point? It's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want to make joints for like a, a racist playlist, you know what I mean? Like, that was not part of my MO ever mm. at all. Um, so it, it wasn't like someone said something racist to me and I was like, oh, that's horrible. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel really bad now. I feel like quitting. It was like, it was like I would see my fans interacting and, you know, this really kind of veiled racism with this you know, kind of national pride and, you know, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie and mm. Australian flags everywhere. That it's like I just kind of equated it to racism because, like, that's what all the racists were doing. Yeah. And, like, and I, yeah, I got to the point of, like, what am I doing this for? And I was like, and, you know, you don't, you know, I know they say you don't pick your audience, but you kind of do a little bit because you dictate to your audience, you know what I mean, every time you release something, every time you do something and everything you do. So it's like if you're attracting a racist audience, you know, you might have to have at some point remove the expectations from them and have a look at yourself. And um, that was what something I had to do. I was like, hang on, if I'm – it's like are they just missing the whole point of everything? So I've really got to like get this to the concentrated message – you know what I mean, and really drive this home to the point where it's like people, when we did um, uh, the AB original record, they were like, oh, we liked it back when you were doing the other stuff. Like they still didn't get it. Even on Shep Life, they didn't get it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, bro, you exhausting motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure by now. They've got it. <laughs> and if they haven't, 
got it by now. Expectations back on them. You know what I mean? Like, fuck that. <laughs> so look, just, just the last couple of things before we finish up. When you think about you growing up and seeing Ice Cube on Rage, you think about growing up and watching The Simpsons and you fast forward a couple of decades and you're touring with Ice Cube and mm. you're interviewing RZA at the Opera House and you're in the writer's room with Matt, Matt Groening of The Simpsons working on uh, on Disenchantment. <laughs> what, what would the, the kids say if, if they could see that? Uh, I wouldn't show him. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because, like, you can't see that. that you, you just got to let that happen. Mm. You know what I mean? You have to see that for yourself. No one else can show you that. What did you learn from being in a room with Matt Groening? The thing you learn is like is how to back yourself and be on the level of that. It's like because they don't have time to make you feel better. You know what I mean? Like mm. not that like anyone makes you feel bad, but by by the time you're in that room, it's expected that you're of a level. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. By the time you're sitting down across from the RZA, it's expected that you've done a lot of general hip hop knowledge and understand, <coughs> you know, who you're talking to. You know, when you're touring with Ice Cube, Ice T, Fifty Cent, it's like it's expected that you will do. You know, you'll keep it professional and you'll do the right thing and do the show and, you know, it's so. That's what you learn. You learn that you're, that, you know, that you're on the right path and you're doing the right things and um, that if you want to be on the next level, you will adhere to it. You know what I mean? Mm. Did you get a chance to tell Ice Cube about that first time seeing his video on Rage and what that did for you? Um. No, I hadn't. Um, like, because that moment kind of didn't come up. Right. Like, I hung with him a few times, but that moment kind of didn't come up. Like, if we had a moment where it was like with me and RZA, then we, then that's something we can like chop up, you know, and be like, and really get to the you know the points of like, you know, what what's his legacy? You know what I mean? How, how does that feel to him? Mm. but like for me and him it's like you know I, and I often keep things it's like he doesn't give a fuck about that <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean like it's fine like, it's, like that's my thing for me you know like <clears throat> when I'm somewhere else and when I've made it or whatever and he can respect me as a as a peer then we'll, then we can trade war stories, you know what yeah. I mean? Cause I'm sure he has that story too about seeing, you know, Rakim or whoever, you know what I mean? Like I'm sure he's got one of those big daddy cane in the pocket. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he'd have one of those stories for sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Everyone does. Everyone was a fan once. That's why we all do what we do. That's it. So Briggs, just before we finish up, um, Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Who would you give credit to for helping you get where you are today? Suffer from the Hilltop Hoods, Trials from AB Original, <laughs> um, JT, um, like those three guys, like musically, are the guys who, you know, are always, always there. Always there. Suf, T and JT, you know what I mean, are the guys that are, that are, you know, every record, you know, every, um, every album, yeah. So, like, you know, Suf gave me $1,500 to make homemade bombs. Mm. The actual press it up. So, like, you know, I paid him back, but um, 
so don't bring that up. So, <laughs> but, but like, you, but you know what I mean. So like, and for for being a cue from Shepherd and have someone believe in you like that, you know, fifteen hundred dollars was a lot of money when you're fucking saving up to be broke. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. So. Yeah, like. Those are the guys, man. Those those three are the, are the dudes who like really, who were really like pivotal in like the actual, you know, Briggs two point or whatever I am today. Yeah, nice. <laughs> whatever version I am, <laughs> Briggs Al Capitan. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Briggs. Look, thanks so much for your time. It's it's been really great chatting to you. Cool, man. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Briggs for his time and thank you for listening. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode or even better, feel free to share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, for the rest of the year, Jackster Pro is free. So if you make music or work behind the scenes in the music industry, head to jackster.com and sign up to become a Jackster Pro member. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening. <laughs>